So on the SAT, uh, some of the problems are in the topics of problem solving and data analysis. In fact, these are only found in the calculator section. Almost half of the calculator section is are these type of problems. Your calculator is allowed on all of these type of problems, although it will only be of minor help to you. Usually you're dividing numbers or something like that here um, that, that you would need to do. So according to the information on the table, what is uh, the approximate age of American elm tree with the diameter of 12 inches? And so in this one, uh, take a second and do this problem. But you notice it, in the reading, it says uh, to find the approximate age, uh, multiply the diameter uh, by a constant called the growth factor. So it basically tells you how to cal do this calculation. So we're talking about American elm trees. So American elm trees is 4.0 and 12. And so it would just be 12 uh, times 4 which is 48, and we got it. So kind of like the science section of the ACT, this was really more of a reading question than a math question. Uh, the math was not uh, very difficult, but you had to read uh, the problem in order to understand how to calculate that. Second type of problem you might see is solving um, involving percentages. And actually this, um, in my other classes, this was the most mispracticed problem of all of them. Try this one for a second. Stop the screencast and try it. And the thing you need to look out for here, now that a lot of people missed, uh, is that tree A produced 20% more pairs than tree B. See, a lot of students kind of calculated this. They figured out 20% um, of 144, subtracted that, and they got the wrong answer. I think the correct answer was uh, B on this one. Um, and the way you get it is you set up some kind of equation. Uh, so 20% more uh, than B is equal to A. So the way I might do that is say 1.2, that's 20% more than something, uh, times B equals A. And then just plug in, uh, we know what uh, A is. In this case, A is 144. And so that is a pretty simple equation. Uh, 1.2, 1.2. And I think, um, again, just use your calculator. I think it ends up being 120. Uh, but definitely that is the answer, whatever 144 divided by what 1, 1.2 is, is your B. Don't take 20% less than A, it's 20% more than B, and there is a difference between those two things. And that was the most missed question on the practice here. It's just a percentage problem. You learn that uh, maybe in middle school, but you have to pay attention to the details there. So unit conversion is a big concept here. Um, on the new SAT. And so it's just a matter of writing it out. Um, I think it helps to kind of, like you do in chemistry class, stoichiometry, you kind of you know, write out the units with stuff. So if I have 2.5 ounces of chocolate, 2.5 ounces, um, and I need, to, that makes uh, for one muffin. Um, so I could even say for one muffin, Um, but really, I want uh, 48 muffins, 48 muffins, and so I'm going to multiply by 48 there. Um, and how many pounds of chocolate? So there's a conversion here, one pound uh, chocolate equals 16 ounces. So maybe something like um, ounces down here, um, denominator, pounds up here, I guess that would be LB. Uh, pounds up here, so it would be one pound is to 16 ounces. And you can see that this uh, cancels out, so the ounce cancels. Uh, muffins cancel, and you're left with pounds here, would be your answer. Um, and so you get uh, whatever that is. Let's try to figure that out. So using your calculator, you can see the answer is 7.5, and you got it. Um, I kind of like those questions, and uh, students usually do pretty well on those. Uh, just keep your work organized, and you should be able to do some unit conversion. Just be prepared. On the SAT, you may have to convert three, four, five times, sometimes in the same problem. Sometimes it's not just uh, one thing, like just pounds to ounces you have to convert. It could be more. So just be prepared for that. Another type of problem you might see is, um, you know, it's talking about linear, quadratic, exponential models to describe uh, different situations. Let's look, look, look at number 17 here. 
Scatter plot gives the tree diameter plotted against age. So here's the scatter plot. The growth factor is closest to that of which of the following uh, species of tree. One thing I might think about doing, remember we, we have this line of best fit somewhere in here. Um, and so if you find, like, I always like to think, which of those points? So they say that point right there. That point um, looks to be about 12.5, comma, 90. See what, the, what those mean. This is the diameter, is 12.5, and the age is uh, 90. And so if you remember back to what it said here, um, it said age was equal to, uh, what was it, the uh, diameter times the growth factor, so the growth factor. Uh, so if you multiply those two, you should get that. So if we know A and D, so this is uh, what A is 90, and the diameter is 12.5, or at least one of, this is one example of that, uh, we might be able to approximate what the growth factor might be. So if we do that, I'm just curious what we get, I don't know how this will work out. So I got uh, 7.2, which is closest to this one um, of all those different growth factors. It wasn't exact, um, so I would go with that choice, and that would be correct. So just this one uh, really is not too bad. Just this kind of like reading a graph and understanding it. Um, according to the graph, uh, which two consecutive years were there the greatest change in the number of 3D movies? So 2003 to 4, so it doesn't look like there were uh, there was much of a change there. Uh, there was no change. 8 and 9, so from here to here, it's a decent amount of change there. That looks like uh, 20 down to about, I don't know, 8, maybe 20 minus 8. And 9 and 10, uh, not as much. It looks like maybe 25 to 20, maybe a 5 unit change. This was 12. And then 10 to 11, oh, that looks like a big change. So 45 minus uh, 25, which is 20 units. So I'd say the biggest change is that one. Not too bad, just reading the graph and understanding it. Compare linear growth uh, with exponential growth. This is interesting because I had a lot of students get this right, but for the wrong reasons. Um, is this a constant rate of growth? In other words, like if you see um, a chart like this, a, a table of values like one, two, three, and maybe these are like a five, um, eight, eleven. So what's happening here for one term to the next, the x value is going up by one each time. So it's going up by one, and the y value is going up by three. So it's every time it goes up by 3. So this is definitely linear because it has a constant rate of change. So uh, 3 over 1 is the slope of this graph, and it has a constant rate of change. Uh, the, as one increases at a constant rate, the other one is increasing at a constant rate. A lot of students chose uh, one of them, but that then said this was their reasoning. Oh, it increased at a constant rate. Not really. Actually, this one increases uh, by, what, 900 here? And then it increases by 9,000. And then it increases by 90,000. So it is not increasing at a constant rate here. Um, now he's getting bigger and bigger and bigger exponentially. And so we actually are multiplying by 10 each time. So this is exponential growth. It's definitely not uh, decreasing, uh, decay. Those are bad answers. So really you're just picking between these two. It's not growing in a linear fashion or a constant rate of change. It's growing exponentially. So it's doubling, tripling, etc. Um, it's growing really fast. Use two way tables to summarize the categorical data. So this is just understanding reading the question. It's not too bad. Um, the survey uh, uh, factors. Uh, the results are below. If one of the surgeons is selected random, which of the following is closest to the probably selected surgeon is an orthopedic surgeon whose indicated professional activity is research. So you did orthopedic and research, and so it looks like there were 74 of those folks. So 74 uh, divided by the grand total, which is 607, and then you would type that in your calculator. And so you get an answer of uh, 0.121, and A would be the correct answer. Nothing tricky about that one. Sorry.
So in this one, we are making inference about a population. So when you take a sample, you kind of guess, okay, if I, if I measure the height of a bunch of people, and I say, okay, the average height was five, six. And so then I think, uh, where, if I took that out of a school, then I would say the average height of a person at that school might be five, six. Even though I didn't sample every person at the school, I took a sample and I'm making inference about how tall I think people at that school might be. Hopefully the sample was random. Um, I certainly, if I took a sample from one school, I can't say, well, that's uh, representative of all schools in Memphis or all schools um, in the United States. Uh, that would be silly. I, if I took a sample from a population of one school, I could only make an inference to that one school. So in this case, uh, we took a survey um, and uh, let's see who did they take. Oh, of the C, a polling agency, a thousand adults uh, were selected at random. I like that from a large city. So from a large city, asked each, are you satisfied with the air quality? Some said they were. Uh, based on the results, which of the following must be true? Of all the adults in the city, 78% are satisfied with the quality of the air. So that's our guess. But a statistician might uh, might say, okay, 78%, but they're always going to have a margin of error. It might be 3%. That's what it is for a lot of polling organizations. In other words, the statistician doesn't say, well, exactly 78% of the population. Actually, we have this thing called a margin of error. And so maybe 81%, maybe 75%, anywhere in that range is what our guess is. That sounds too um, specific for a statistician to say that. Uh, let's see if a statistician might say this. If another 1,000 adults were selected from the same city, exactly 78% of them would say, say that. Well, I don't know. Maybe the percentages would change if there's a new 1,000 people there. So I think that's uh, not a good assumption to make. If 1,000 adults were selected from a different city, 78% would. Well, we don't know anything about a different city. That's, we can't make an inference about a different city here. Uh, so in this case, the answer would be none. And finally, um, this concept is a t concept that's tested, uh, which is uh, skewed data uh, versus symmetric data. So if data is symmetric, uh, the mean and the median will literally be right in the middle. They'll be the same value, very, very close to each other. If you have a couple big outliers, like, you know, some the data, really the center is kind of over here, that's the median. Uh, but you have some huge outliers here that's pulling the mean. So what gets, gets happened is the mean gets pulled towards the skew. The mean is now pulled away from the median because these big outliers, big, big, huge values will have a huge effect on the mean. It gets pulled towards the direction of the skew. You have to know that concept here. Survey was taken, um, homes in a country. And the, the mean home was 165, mean home was 125. So if we look at that, 125 is the uh, median. And the mean was 165. 165 was the mean, sorry. Um, that to me looks like it's skewed right. There's some big home values, maybe million dollar home values out here because uh, it's been pulled to the right, the homes. They have values that are close to each other. There are few homes that are valued much less, few homes that are valued much more. Um, that seems like the best possibility here. It looks like because the mean and median are not the same and the mean has been pulled to the right, there must be some big outlying values out here to the right. And so that's the better measure of center is the median in this case. Median home price is what you see. Uh, as you look around the country, that's the stat of choice for home values.